for joining us. Um, and uh, yeah, it's finally great to be in uh, Alberta, Canada. Um, I, I used to work in New Zealand prior to this. And of course, in right now, there's summer time in New Zealand and uh, it's kind of came as a rude shock to me when I came here. I, I did stay in Iowa, so I have experienced some winter. You guys um, have a much colder uh, winter over here. So anyway, so let's start with our presentation. Uh, we are gonna talk about embryo transfer in horses today. Um, and before we start, I would just request you guys to mute your microphones so we don't have any disturbances in between. Uh, you guys can always um, ask us questions after the presentation's done, and we'll be happy to answer as many questions as possible, All right? So uh, this is something that we thought we would kind of uh, do a quick chat about. So clients who know about this already uh, should be good and set to go, but uh, new people uh, for this technology or to this technology can definitely learn a few things and they can clear some doubts uh, some sometimes people just have a lot of doubts and are afraid to kind of approach a new technology. So our goal over here is to just go through the basics of what we actually uh, do um, in our clinic or in the veterinary hospital when we perform embryo transfers in horses and some basics behind it. Uh, and again, I'm, I've, I've tried to keep it as simple and non-technical as possible, but feel free to ask me any questions that you may have. So uh, what exactly is an embryo transfer? As its name suggests, uh, an embryo transfer is essentially a transfer of a live embryo. So we are taking this embryo from, from your hair, which is the donor or the mother of that embryo. And we are transferring this embryo to the uterus of an ideal recipient mare, which is the surrogate mom. So it's not a very new technology. Embryo transfer has been for many decades now, and the first embryo transfer successfully carried out in horses that resulted in a live foal was performed for the first time in 1974. Again, once that technology started becoming more standard, uh, people started kind of investigating and researching uh, on how to freeze embryos and even transfer uh, frozen embryos inside mares. So again, we have a live foal from a an embryo that was first produced in 1982. So again, it's not a very new thing that we are doing over here. It's been around for at least 25 or 30 years now. Again, this led to more research. This led to more investigations with you know, better technology, with better freezing techniques now, uh, or better storage techniques of embryos. Uh, and ultimately now we have come to a point where we can even perform a procedure called as ICSI. ICSI means intracytoplasmic sperm injection, where we actually inject the sperm directly inside the mare's egg. So this technology now has become very common uh, besides embryo transfer. And the first fold from this new technology was produced in 1996. So we have come a long way since 1974. We now have um, a lot of choices with us uh, in which we can decide which would be the best choice to get our mare pregnant, right? Which is what we want. So what are the benefits of embryo? Is this technology right for you? Should you invest money? Should you invest time in performing embryo transfers for your mares? So these are some potential advantages of embryo transfers in horses. They, again, these are, and this is an exhaustive list. Uh, and again, some of these advantages or some of these conditions would relate to your own mares. So uh, we definitely can get more folds per mare per year. And if you have a valuable mare and if you want to even produce two or three folds and uh, or two or three embryos per year and keep some embryos frozen, you can produce those embryos from a single mare in a single year. Of course, that is dependent heavily on your breed registry requirements. Different breeds have different requirements as to how many number of folds you can register per year. So each breed has its own set of requirements and we would highly encourage you guys to go up to your breed registry or, in, or ask us and we'll be able to tell you how many folds you could register per year for that particular breed. Of course, uh, if you have a mare that's, um, that's got some issues, older mares or mares with uh, pelvic issues or mares with reproductive problems or mares with severe health issues, 
these males definitely uh, benefit from the embryo transfer program because they can just donate an embryo. They do not have to carry that embryo to term. They do not have to go through the stress of pulling. And thus, you can essentially avoid all these complications due to the pregnancy and due to the pulling in these donor males. Again, older males can definitely be the donors and they can, uh, they can donate these embryos to much younger recipient males and that way you can avoid again the whole issue about carrying this pregnancy forward and potential folding complications in older males. Males with unhealthy reproductive tracts could be good candidates for embryo transfer. Uh, if a male has a bad uterus, she most likely has no issues conceiving, which means she does get pregnant. However, she cannot just carry that pregnancy forward. And these males would be excellent candidates to flush embryos out and put them inside the tract or healthy uh, reproductive tract of the recipient male. Males with histories of pregnancy losses, uh, most, most males sometimes will lose pregnancies in the midterm. Some males can get placentitis. Some males get, uh, lose pregnancies even in early pregnancies, uh, early, early uh, term of their, of their pregnancy, some, something that we know, call as early embryonic losses. And these males certainly can benefit from embryo transfers. If you have a mare that has a busy athletic carrier, for example, it's a dressage horse, or it's a show jumping horse, and, and this mare is busy throughout the year attending various competitions, you definitely don't want this mare to be carrying that pregnancy for another year and thus lose out on her athletic career. So in those cases, we would encourage you to get the mare in, we'll flush the embryo out, and then this mare can be on her way and then can still attend shows or still attend uh, various competitions that she's meant to. Mares with severe health issues like laminitis, for example, or musculoskeletal problems or Cushing's syndrome can be good candidates for embryo transfer. Uh, most of these mares, again, have no issues conceiving. However, they have a problem um, either carrying that pregnancy to term or being able to successfully sustain the stress of pregnancy. A lot of these mares sometimes get sick, especially mares with chronic laminitis and can get a sudden flare up of that laminitis in late pregnancy just because of the sheer weight on their, on their, on their legs. Mares that fall late in the year and say you have a mare that's falling as late as say uh, June or July, and then you, do, you want to start early uh, in the next year, there's no benefit of getting this mare pregnant and letting her carry her foal. In that case, you could get this mare in, we can flush an embryo for you, you can leave the mare non-pregnant for that year and then breed her early in the next part. So you can have an earlier start on this mare in the following year. And again, of course, uh, besides putting this mare, putting this embryo directly inside a reset, you can always freeze the embryos. We can uh, store these embryos for you. We can use these embryos at a later date. If you have a fancy mare with great genetics, and if you want to ship the embryo uh, abroad or internationally, we can definitely explore those options of shipping embryos outside. If you want to even ship an embryo to a large recipient herd, like for example, in the United States, they have large herds, about 800 to 1,000 mares in a herd. And if you want to specifically send an embryo to a specific recipient herd, we'll be happy to ship the embryo for you. So that's, again, a big advantage of embryo flushing. And last but not the least, if you have a mare or a stallion uh, where you are unsure about their infertility issue, you have tried everything to get this mare pregnant, or you've tried everything to get improve the semen quality on the stallion. And if you want to know if they're fertile or not, you can do something called as a test breeding where you can breed a mare uh, to this particular stallion semen, and we can flush her at day seven to see if she's actually carrying an embryo. Now, when we do pregnancy checks, we usually check these mares at 14 days, which is two weeks. And by that time, sometimes these mares that already are carrying an embryo might lose the embryo. So the mare comes up as non-pregnant, and that's why we think that this mare has some issues going on. So, especially in these mares or these stallions, we can flush an embryo within a week itself. And thus we have an answer that yes, the stallion is fertile or the mare is fertile. It's just that she can't carry that pregnancy forward, right? So these are some benefits of uh, performing an embryo transfer 
in horses. Again, uh, the next question that clients usually ask us is what's the success rate? Like I'm going to invest this X amount of money, I'm going to invest X amount of time uh, and efforts in trying to get you know, my mare to you. Uh, what is the success rate of uh, investing in this money? Right? So the overall success rate, what we call as the live foal, depends on different factors. So of course, you need to have a good donor mare, uh, a good mare that can produce good embryos. And subsequently, you also need to have a good recipient mare or a good surrogate mom that will carry this pregnancy forward very successfully without the risk of losing it. And then, of course, the technical part is the, uh, the expertise in collecting these embryos and the expertise in transfer. So all of these together contribute to the success of this procedure. So a small equation would be the embryo transfer pregnancy rate per cycle would be a summation or multiplication of the embryo collection rate in percentage as well as the transfer pregnancy rate. So what percent of mares would actually give us an embryo at the collection time? And that multiplied by the actual pregnancy uh, rate after the transfer would give you the overall pregnancy rate per cycle. There are some major limitations in mares, however, unlike cattle and unlike other ruminants, if you, some of you guys may have uh, cows that you frequently flush for embryos. In cows, we can actually super ovulate these animals by giving them certain hormones, which means in one single a cow could produce anywhere from 15 to 20 embryos. However, that, that's a very severe limitation in mares. Mares do not uh, once, one is it's very difficult to super ovulate mares. There have been some, some drugs, there are, there's a lot of research that has been done. However, we do not have a very perfect technique where we get more than two embryos per cycle. So that's a major limitation in super ovulating mares. And plus nowadays, those drugs are not available. So we can expect to get one at the most two embryos if the mare has double ovulated per cycle. So that's a reality check that you guys need to know is that you can get one or at the most two embryos per cycle per mare. Yeah, overall collection rates are pretty good. Uh, average rates are about 50 to 65%, meaning uh, when we flush a mare, that's the amount of times we usually get an embryo out. And again, this depends on the semen quality. It depends on if the mare has any infertility issues or if the stallion has good semen or not. Even the kind of semen you're using, like for example, fresh semen will definitely have a higher success rate than frozen semen, right? And then your pregnancy rates after the transfer usually average anywhere from 70 to 90%. Again, these depend on the actual transfer techniques that we use. Uh, they also depend on the embryo quality. Uh, and we'll come to that. I'll, I'll show you how we grade embryos and how we evaluate if an embryo is of a good quality or not. And then of course, how well you guys manage your recipients when they are carrying that fold, right? So an average predicted success per cycle is somewhere anywhere from 35 to 60%. That is the success rate you can easily guess or expect from a mare that's undergoing an embryo transfer technique. Uh, we need to have a reality check that some mares will still lose pregnancies. So most mares, there's an 8 to 10% chance of a mare losing her pregnancy. And that's not just for embryo transfer mares, even your normal mares that have been bred without any um, extra external help, will still um, lose or uh, have a risk of losing pregnancies um, uh, during their, uh, regardless of whether they were transferred, these embryos were transferred, regardless of whether these males were bred naturally. Right. So uh, what's actually involved in the process? So a lot of clients uh, ask us, when you actually do this process, what all you do? So this is kind of, a flow chart, or this is the series of events that happen when we do an embryo, when we set for an embryo transfer program. So initially we try to select your donor and we also try to select recipient mares and we try to make sure that these animals are uh, and they are disease free when we uh, do this. This contributes to the success of that program. Uh, Hold on a second. My dog's trying to eat my back. Hold on a second. Okay. 
Sorry about that. Anyway, so after we select your donor and your recipient mayor, we try to treat these donors or recipients if it is necessary, if we, if, we if we find out that the donor has some disease process in her uterus, we try to fix that. If the recipient is unhealthy, we try to fix that because that is what ultimately contributes to the success of the program. Then we try to synchronize the heat between the donor and the recipient. So when we actually put an embryo inside a recipient, the recipient has to be at the same stage of her cycle as the donor, right? So we try to sync their cycles together using different hormone protocols. And then when we, when we start doing that, we start monitoring these girls, just like we would uh, monitor a mare using an ultrasound exam uh, during your normal breeding process. We will monitor the donor and monitor the recipient during this entire process to see where they are in their cycle to detect the day of ovulation and make sure that they are ovulating as close to each other as possible. After we time um, the mayor, uh, after we time the donor and the recipient, we document the day of ovulation because that day is important for us to determine on what day should we be flushing the donor. Once we flush the donor, we evaluate the embryo, we grade the embryo, and then if we deem that the embryo is nice and healthy, and if we deem that the recipient is ready to receive the embryo, we will transfer the embryo inside the ideal recipient. And then once the embryo is transferred, we'll monitor the recipient just like you would do in a regular mare uh, and make sure that she's carrying that pregnancy successfully to term. So that is all that is involved in the process and we'll kind of break it down and we'll discuss each portion in a little bit of the detail. So donor mare management. So you need to have which is reproductively she has to be happy and healthy. We've always found that mares that are stress-free produce better quality embryos, as well as a recipient that is stress-free is able to carry that embryo successfully forward. And you know that usually results in a life form. Uh, so older mares usually have poor quality eggs, just like uh, our human side, uh, the fertility starts kind of decreasing as the mare's age advances. So if you have a mare that's 18, 20, 22 years of age, uh, yes, she will still produce an egg. Yes, she will still get pregnant. Yes, we may still get embryos. However, there is a chance that these embryos may be of a poor quality. So that is a reality check that we need to acknowledge before we are getting into this procedure. And of course, if you have a poor quality egg, it produces a poor quality embryo. If you have a poor quality embryo, there is a big chance or a greater chance that this embryo may not um, progress successfully inside a good recipient. Uh, we need to evaluate your donors. So when we, if, if you have a donor that you want to put through this program, we will uh, make sure that we uh, check this may have via an ultrasound exam, we may culture her uterus to make sure that she's free of infection. And we'll try to identify any potential prob problems well beforehand, uh, before we try to breed this mare or try to flush an embryo out. Uh, and then we also recommend that donors ideally should carry one pregnancy during their lifetime. If you, want, if you have a mare that you want to flush repeatedly, which is fine, mares can be flushed repeatedly. However, with repeated flushings, these mares sometimes are more prone to developing infections inside their uterus. Uh, their cervix shuts more tightly, and when their cervix shuts more tightly, they tend to accumulate more fluid. So we recommend that donor mares should at least be, uh, be, a, be able to carry a pregnancy to term at least once in their lifetime to make sure that their reproductive tract is healthy, right? And this can be before or after. Read the mayor after flushing. Uh, the recipients, according to me, um, the recipient has uh, a bigger role to play. Yes, the donor definitely gives us an embryo, but it's the recipient surrogate mom that carries that pregnancy successfully to term. So you, you need to have you need to give these recipients total loving care or TLC. Ideally, we would like our recipients to be anywhere from four to ten years of age. So you need to have young mares essentially. Most of these mares should be medically sound. They should not have any issues uh, that should be affecting the health of their reproductive tract. 
And we like to select the recipients well in advance. So we, we start selecting our recipients late in late fall or early winter. And that way we have a better handle on things. If we have a recipient with some issues, reproductive issues, we try to correct it well before the breeding season starts. If we have a large herd of recipients, we try to introduce that recipient into the herd. And so that she acclimatizes, she makes friends, she is not beaten around, we can monitor her. We've also seen that mares that are usually lower on the totem pole or lower on the hierarchy within the herd are also stressed out. And some of these mares, even though they are medically sound, they have an excellent reproductive tract, can habitually lose pregnancies just because of the stress. And hence, we need to make sure that these mares are happy, these mares are grouped in uh, uh, or, or are kept in herds that, uh, that do not beat on them. Uh, so they don't have any competition for food. Uh, they are not being um, kind of beaten around. Uh, they are not under stress, essentially. We would like your recipient mare to be of the same size as the donor. If you have a recipient that's much smaller than your donor, then you can expect a small scrawny foal to be born. Um, ideally, recipients are used every other year. So for example, if we put an embryo inside the recipient this year, she's gonna fall the next year, and then she, we will wait till she's weaned off. So she essentially gets a time off of about one and a half, or close to two years before she's bred again. So she's bred every other year, which is great because it gives her a chance to kind of rest her reproductive tract, okay? When we get recipients from you, we need a very thorough reproductive as well as medical history from you guys, if you, especially if you know the mayor well. So if you know that if, if this mare has carried pregnancies in the past, if she's lost pregnancies in the past, if she is a difficult mare to deal with, if she uh, is, a, is an aggressive mare, we need to know that so that we can make a better choice for you in selecting these recipients. Uh, and like I said before, a happy stress-free recipient uh, usually results in better pregnancy rates. And I cannot stress this enough, you need to have a recipient that's well-fed, if you have a recipient that's losing weight, that's not a good sign. That won't be a good candidate for embryo transfer. So uh, you need to make sure that your recipients are absolutely healthy because the whole success of this program depends on how healthy this recipient is, okay? We try to synchronize the reproductive cycles like I mentioned before. So we want both of these group of mares, the donor and the recipient to cycle around each other. So they should be ovulating as close to each other as possible, sometimes ideally even on the same day, right? So the ideal scenario is to have two or three recipients per donor, but sometimes that is not all, always possible. And hence we try to synchronize their cycles using this. Uh, it's okay if the recipient ovulates one or two days after the donor or one, one day before the donor. And nowadays with you know, less and less recipients being available. There's more research that has been carried out in this, um, in this field. And now research has shown that a recipient could even ovulate up to four days after the donor and still carry the pregnancy successfully to term. And these recipients of course need some extra hormones, but there's enough data that shows us that a recipient could of late three or four days even after the donor. So which has also led uh, us to check these mares less frequently. Earlier we used to check these mares more frequently to make sure that we knew the day that they ovulated. Uh, you can synchronize estrus uh, or synchronize heat in these two group of mares using various hormone protocols. And we have different drugs that are available. We have prostaglandins, we have uh, progesterone and estro estrogen injections. There's Regimate along with prostaglandin that we can use. And it depends. It depends on how many resets you have per mare. It depends on the time of the year. It depends on uh, the costs. And we will uh, make sure that we select the best possible protocol for your mare and the recipient. Nowadays, uh, there's new research that has shown that even non-cycling uh, mares can be used. So mares that still haven't even started cycling in the year can also be used as recipients. We can give them certain hormones once for X number of days. And then these mares can successfully be used as recipients, even though they don't have any structures 
growing on of any follicles growing on their ovaries yet. Okay. So this is the technique in short. Uh, this uh, pictorial diagram shows the back end of the mare. And then as you can see, uh, there is my arrows kind of pointing towards this uterine flushing media that's in the bag. This bag is connected to a three-way uh, kind of a catheter system. This line uh, pushes the fluid inside the track of the mare. And once this mare's uterus starts becoming full of that fluid, we shut the clamp over here that prevents any more fluid going in. And then we siphon this fluid off. And this fluid then flows out and then goes inside a filter. And this is how a filter looks like. It's got a sieve over here that filters the embryo or rather traps the embryo and gets the extra fluid out. So the extra fluid, excuse me, the extra fluid is collected below and we usually use a graduated cylinder to measure how much fluid we have collected. So we should get almost 98%, uh, 95 to 98% of the fluid out in and that kind of ensures a very thorough flush. Most embryos usually come out within the first half or two centimeters of that solution. But sometimes mares with large uteruses or mares that have fold in the past couple of weeks require large amounts of fluid uh, to be flushed in. And uh, based on the size of that mare or the size of the tract, we will use the appropriate amount of fluid to flush that uterus out. Uh, this picture shows the tubing that's associated with this process. And again, there's a small filter that's attached at the end of that tubing. Once we flush the uterus, uh, we kind of put the fluid inside a small petri dish. It's a small glass dish like this. And then we look, search for the embryo inside this petri dish. And sometimes this dish contains a lot of debris that comes out of that mare's uterus. So we need to keep on searching among that cellular debris to make sure that we haven't missed that embryo out. Depending on the day that you're flushing, if you're flushing a mare at day eight or day nine after she ovulates, some of these embryos are pretty large. So you can actually see an embryo here with a naked eye inside the, uh, uh, inside that fl the filter uh, media itself. And then, uh, uh, if you observe this embryo under a microscope, uh, this is how an embryo looks like. It's nice and round. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's shiny. It's, uh, we are fortunate that POS embryos are pretty large. They're much larger than bovine embryos. So it's sometimes it's very easy to identify them, especially if we flush them, the mare after day seven. And then once we identify this embryo, we will make these multiple drops inside a petri dish and we will transfer the embryo from one drop to the other in successive manner and sometimes we'll even use up to eight to ten drops uh, depending on how dirty that fluid was when we collected it and the whole idea is to wash the embryo so if this embryo had any bacteria sticking to it if the if the if the embryo had any other uh, cellular debris sticking to it we want to make sure that we are transferring a nice and clean embryo inside your recipient mare. Okay. So before we perform the transfer, we grade the embryo. So while we are looking at the embryo under the microscope, we can identify different grades of the embryo. And the whole point or the whole aspect of grading an embryo is to make sure that we know what quality of an embryo are we putting inside your recipient mare. So grade one embryos are beautiful, pristine embryos. Uh, they have any or few uh, detectable abnormalities um, and they have the highest potential for successful pregnancies. They are the best quality embryos, right? Grade two embryos may have mild abnormalities uh, and sometimes a grade two embryo may even turn into a grade one embryo after a little time is given for it to sit in the media. Uh, and usually grade two embryos have almost a similar success rate for pregnancy uh, uh, success as a grade one embryo does. And so we'll, we'll without hesitation, we'll go ahead and transfer grade two embryos as well. Grade, two, grade three embryos do have significant abnormalities. And if you compare this grade one to grade three, you can see how ruffled the edges are, the cellular mass kind of looks rough inside. The capsule around the embryo is kind of misshapen. 
And some of these embryos uh, do not result, of course, in uh, a high pregnancy rate. So they can have a significant negative impact on the pregnancy rates. So we will still put grade three embryos inside mares. However, we will, we will make a note of it and we will also inform you about the embryo quality. With grade four embryos, you can see severe abnormalities. If you compare a grade four embryo to a grade one embryo, you can see, you can almost, uh, you know, say that, you know, uh, it looks very different. So grade four embryos have a very poor success rate. Uh, I, I have seen grade four embryos. Uh, we actually don't even transfer grade four embryos in service CPM mares because um, there's a way of, uh, if negligible success rate of these embryos developing into folds. So once we uh, grade these embryos, we will then uh, load them into semen straws. Just these, these straws are similar to the straws that are used for packing semen. And then uh, we, we kind of load them in a specific manner so that the embryo is not lost in the ground or doesn't kind of squirt out during the transfer process. So this is kind of a pictorial depiction of how we load the embryo. The embryo is in a fluid uh, kind of column right in the center of the straw. And it's kind of um, on both sides, it's flanked by this air pockets that prevents this fluid from pulling out. We make sure that our transfer procedure is very clean and very sterile when we put this embryo inside a recipient mare. We always check the recipient mare prior to the transfer to make sure that she is at the same stage, her reproductive tract looks good. She uh, looks like she is a good recipient to receive the embryo. And then we may sedate the mare. Uh, some of these recipients require some anti-inflammatory agents like flunixin. Uh, depending on the recipient, some of these recipients may also require extra hormone supplementation like progesterone or regimic to be given. Uh, and then we do this embryo transfer non-surgically, just like an embryo transfer is done in cattle. We go inside, uh, push the embryo in slowly and release it inside the uterus. And then after about a week, we will start monitoring these mares by ultrasound examination. We try to you know, repeated, do repeated exams on these mares, especially to identify and make sure that the embryo is growing at the same rate as it should ideally. And then on some mares, on some recipient mares that have lost pregnancies in the past, we might even monitor their progesterone. We might pull blood and send it for progesterone evaluation. And progesterone is the hormone that maintains pregnancy. So if this mare is low on that hormone, we will inject her with a progesterone injection or put her on regimate supplementation uh, till a safe period is reached in her pregnancy and we can then withdraw it gradually. Uh, besides embryo transfer, we can also perform embryo freezing. So if you do not have a recipient mare readily available for your transfer, we can freeze this embryo for you get a recipient mare, or you could even put this embryo inside the donor mare at a later date. Like you have a mare that's going for a competition, you do not have a recipient mare, you can still bring the donor mare in, we'll flush the embryo out, freeze it, and then once your donor mare is done competing, you can bring her back in, we we'll transfer that embryo inside this donor mare. So again, there are various advantages to it. You can preserve genetics of valuable mares. You can have more than one embryo frozen as an insurance policy for you. Uh, so you transfer one embryo and then repeatedly flush this uh, mare for multiple embryos and keep them as insurance policy for future use. Uh, again, you can import or export these embryos. Um, it minimizes the number of recipients that are required for the transfer, especially if you have the advantage of freezing it for a later date. And then multiple embryos, of course, can be collected for future use. And then uh, you can also collect embryos later in the year. Say a mare's missed her breeding for some reason. You can collect the mare late in the season and then transfer this embryo early in the season uh, in the following year. Right? There are various methods for freezing embryos. Uh, the traditional method had been, has been a slow cool method, a slow cooling method. Uh, however, there's a new technique called as vitrification, and these are the kits that are commercially available. And vitrification essentially is a very quick, rapid freezing process can be done. 
uh, without um, you know, use of specialized equipment. It can be even done in your barn if you have a nice, clean, warm place. And we can do this out in the field as well as inside the hospital. And it gives us a big advantage of freezing embryos at a much faster rate uh, and at a much better rate. There are a good acceptable pregnancy rates uh, after putting vitrified embryos inside recipient mares, uh, almost close to 70% of these embryos will take. Um, so this is just my small introduction to embryo transfer. Uh, we'll be happy to take any questions if you guys have any. Candace has one. Um, what are the costs associated with freezing an embryo? So, this one ends probably uh, yeah. like, give me a week. <laughs> I, what I can do is, so we, we will be more than happy to share the costs. All of these procedures are ideally on a one-to-one -one basis, but as a ballpark figure, as a, I, I don't remember the actual costs. As a ballpark figure, you're still looking maybe at about four or $500 for freezing an embryo. And I'm, I, I'm probably talking about like prices back in New Zealand. Uh, based on, I'm, I'm talking about the New Zealand based prices, uh, I'll probably have to sit with Lana and we'll have to figure out how much it costs for the kits over here in Canada, uh, as well as all the supplies. But if you want to just put a rough figure out, then I would probably say roughly about $500. Yeah, and I'll just Partially blocked oviducts, thoughts yeah. and methods to deal with this. I'm sorry? Partially blocked oviducts. Yeah. Thoughts and methods to deal with this. So there are a couple of ways uh, of doing that. One, there are three methods actually of uh, dealing with blocked oviducts. The most traditional method that has been around for a long, long time is by injecting a prostaglandin gel on directly onto the oviduct with a laparoscope. So we, we essentially, so this is a standing procedure. We prep the mare for surgery and we push a laparoscope from her flank inside her abdomen and we inject this PGE gel directly onto the oviduct because we can see it through the laparoscope, right? So that has been the traditional method. Now, again, it involves surgery. It has a higher cost. So now there are two other alternate methods uh, that can be used. One method is to try and we push an endoscope inside the mare's reproductive tract from the back end, just like you would scope a horse's upper respiratory tract. We push a scope inside the mare's tract and we try to thread or catheterize these oviducts and flush them, right? So if, if we don't have that kind of a gear, then there's a third method now that's available where we push the PGE gel directly. Like with a, with a scope, we can just go in and push that gel on the end of that uterotubal junction. So where the oviduct meets the uterus, we try to get the gel as close to that area as possible. And uh, that has also shown to have uh, a good pregnancy rate after that procedure is done. So there's Are a, there so any in short an invasive and non-invasive procedure. So both of these processes can be done for your mares. Perfect. Are there any side effects or risks associated with flushing a mare, especially if done a few times or a multiple years? So no, um, there are no known disadvantages or no known issues that could affect the reproductive efficiency of a mare in future if multiple flushes are done on a mare the same year or year after year. Uh, the only thing that I mentioned in one of my slides earlier was that we recommend that donor mares do carry one pregnancy to term at least, and that kind of opens up their tract, that kind of tones their tract up, their cervix is much more relaxed and opens up really quickly, and that these mares are thought to have lesser issues than maiden mares that are just repeatedly flushed year after year. But the flushing itself does not cause any issues to the health of the man. Perfect. 
Um, Megan's got a question. Um, when when do you suggest they carry age tightening of cervix? Megan, I'm just gonna I'm gonna unmute ask you to unmute, okay? I might be able to get you. Hey. There? There you go. Yep. You okay. betcha. So if you have, I've got a mare turning 13 this year. Um, we've flushed her several times. She does have what we believe now to be partially blocked oviducts after we've flushed her on fresh and frozen and she'll carry, like she'll produce an embryo and the other times it just doesn't make sense as to why she's not producing when everything's went really well. Um, but her cervix is starting to tighten. How much longer do I have before I have to let her carry? If the cervix has already started tightening, I would recommend breeding this mare now and letting her carry. Uh, but you can the, still. The, 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 reason, the reason why I'm saying that is that uh, with repeated flushing, well, I mean, we are manipulating that cervix, right? We are going yep. through with that catheter. So it does cause micro injuries. Like we are not, like, we are not going to get blood on a hand or something when we come out, yep. but we do cause insult to that cervix each time we go in so which is what causes that cervical fibrosis to happen and it's it's a irreversible process so if it is still not that bad i would recommend carrying letting her carry before it turns really bad okay that's what i mean yep okay we're gonna discuss that in a slide Okay, I just I just muted you again, Meg. Um, are, any other questions for Doctor Say? He kind of got he came to Canada what just last week I guess almost a week you've been here. One so week. you got came to Canada, got uh, the wonderful official welcome on right, Monday yeah. night and two. Exactly. <laughs> well, the first few first two or three days were really nice because it wasn't that cold, uh, sunshine. In no, but no, this is this is fine. This is not. This is not much different than Iowa, so yeah, it's all right. So yeah, so you're here. We're we'll get things rolling, and we're gonna have some more stuff coming up for all of our repro clients that we're gonna be sharing online. Um, so stay tuned. Definitely, there's gonna be lots of stuff going on. Doctor Say is gonna be working with our repro team and getting things set up. If you have any questions, you're always welcome to email them at repro yeah, at Plenty yeah. Services. Yeah, feel free to email um, us. And email. Yeah. Yeah. We're totally, we're totally um, open and happy to help in any way that we can. So looking forward to a really exciting uh, next yeah. year. Lots of exciting stuff coming down the pipe. Yeah, yeah, looking forward to it. Awesome. Well, if there's no other questions, um, I do have this recorded. So don't worry, we'll post it up on our, our YouTube channel as well. So I'm just going to stop the recording. And if there's any other chit chat, people want to ask questions, you're welcome to stay on.